Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're chatting with leaders of nonprofits that honor the work and sacrifice of our firefighters and their families and provide a number of supportive services. Helping us to understand this important work are special guests, Chief Rick Martinez, Executive Director of the California Fire Foundation, and Chief Ron John Shonicki, Executive Director of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation of Maryland. So this is just so wonderful. I'm so happy that that uh, you're both here to help us. The professional lives of firefighters are uh, have traditionally included periods of downtime punctuated by intense activities, but it seems like activity and intensity is, is really the name of the game now, um, particularly across the West where uh, fires have become just rampant and more frequent with greater intensity and families are, are bearing the brunt of this. So let's let's talk about the upfront risks that firefighters face, how we can ameliorate those risks and how we can uh, do justice to these very brave men and women and their families um, as they serve us and they protect us. Rick, could you just talk a little bit about, about the life that, that firefighters are, are living today? Well, well, first, Mark, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, Chief Sarnicki and I go a long ways back, and uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say I started my career in the fire service 40 years ago. And what I can tell you with, uh, I feel some accuracy, is that the job of a firefighter or the life of a firefighter and their families have changed dramatically in the last 40 years. Um, I still engage and participate with respect to being around firefighters. I have a son that's a firefighter and a stepdaughter that's a firefighter and uh, both career in California here. And today's firefighter, uh, as opposed to those of my generation, to the, the expected work, the bar has been raised significantly. It's a much more complex job. The volume of firefighting is increased, not, not just from the purest sense of fighting a fire, but all the other activities that firefighters provide their communities today with respect to emergency medical services, hazardous materials, uh, technical rescue. And what we see today in the workforce uh, is a, a better trained, a better equipped, a uh, better educated firefighter. But to that end, they're also um, stressed a lot more. They're worked a lot more than in my day. So. Um, the impacts of not only in California, for those of us in California, the wildland season, which is almost year round now, uh, but also just the day to day activity, call volumes are through the roof in just about every jurisdiction you can find. And that has an impact. Uh, there was a comment made uh, earlier in a discussion about uh, downtime for firefighters, and there's not a lot of downtime. Uh, you know, it, there used to be more downtime for both, you know, preparing, training, uh, maintaining equipment and station. Today, those are kind of squeezed into the daily activities uh, of their routine shifts. Well, it's, it, it, it just seems that the, the circumstances have changed and we're trying to uh, play catch up. And the, the people who are bearing the, um, the, the, the stress of that, Ron, are the frontline uh, folks. So whereas previously they might have been more, as as uh, Rick said, uh, there might have been more downtime, more recovery time, uh, more ability to gain rest. Uh, now um, it, it really does all fall on the frontline uh, folks to to uh, to bear this. Could you just sort of comment on on your take on on uh, what Rick said in terms of the change situation? Absolutely, and and also thanks for having me on today, Mark. It's good to, to chat with you. And Rick, it's always a pleasure to see you, my friend. I'm glad we could talk about these important issues for our fire service community. But but you're absolutely right that the demands on the first responders, our firefighting forces, has changed dramatically, and and it starts with basic training requirements, much more uh, training programs are needed to be able to provide the services. If you think about that, you know, when there's an emergency, no matter what it may be in a community, people call the fire department. They're, 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 they're there. They're, they're the ones that get there uh, oftentimes uh, very quickly and in support of whatever the emergency might be. It might be fire, it might be EMS, hazardous materials, but, but that does 
uh, create that intensification of the number of calls. And that brings about that there isn't as much downtime as there used to be, but it really brings the stressors. And that, that's an element we talk about within the behavioral health support mechanisms that are in place within the fire community. And a lot of them are peer-based because who better to understand what a firefighter is going through than another firefighter who's been there. But, but we have those stressors related to call volume, training requirements, but also the life pieces, you know, the, the family element. Uh, unfortunately, we see issues related to financial issues, unfortunately, marital issues that, that impact all of us. You know, we're all humans and, and, and those things are real life elements. But, but we see the need for the fire service to be more prepared to address more volume of calls, but more categories of calls. And so that creates that stress level as well. But having a solid peer program in place, and there's a lot of great ones out there, helps those firefighters kind of diffuse. And often it's around the kitchen table at the firehouse. That is a significant point where we have seen a great deal of help and support for the firefighters. And then if they're you know, more comfortable and they're less stressed, when they go home to the families, that stress level decreases at, at the home kitchen table as well. And it's all related. It's, it's all part of that package. And uh, that's why there are programs out there to provide that support and assistance. Can we talk a little bit about the structure of, of staffing of the whole firefighting corps? Because that is something that, that is, I think, underappreciated. What is the proportion, Rick, of firefighters in this country that are volunteers versus full-time paid professionals. Do you do you do you have that statistic at your at your hand? It's my understanding, and that's something that I'm not really focused on. Ron may be in a little better shape to answer that question, but basically, I think about thirty plus percent of the firefighters across the United States are career, and many more are volunteer. Uh, and that's due in large part is the, the demographics of an area. In California, that number is probably, that career is, might be a little greater with respect to, because we have more, we have some significant metropolitan areas and typically volunteers do protect communities that are smaller, uh, rural in some cases. So, uh, you know, you, you have a mix, but I, I do want to caution those watching today or listening today, uh, that when we talk about firefighters, be they volunteer career, that for the most part, you know, they are, their training is standardized. And so the volunteers do a, a great deal to donate their time and their efforts uh, to help protect those communities that sometimes they just simply can't afford a career staff, you know, and, and so it's an interesting well, dynamic. I, I, the, the one third, two thirds, right? Two thirds being volunteer across the country um, is, is really an interesting, um, an interesting point because the question of support for uh, firefighters, the loss of income during fire season and, and how people are, are being called and they're stressed because, you know, regardless to what their, uh, their career is, all of a sudden they're pulled onto the line and then with all the stresses that, that come from that and the loss of income and, and those kinds of things, we're not necessarily set up during this huge increase in, in, um, in fires. We're not necessarily set up to support everyone the way that the communities have, have previously supported. Uh, Ron, how do, how do we fix this? Because there's only so much resources that um, that you have as a nonprofit, how do we shift? What are the things that we can do to make this situation better? If you were going to have the ability to create a checklist and give it to every community, what should, what should I do with my community? What should my state do? What should my municipality do? What should, what should the country do? So, so first of all, Rick is, is accurate with his numbers. It's a 67, 33% ratio between career and volunteer. And, 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 and another statement that was made is accurate. It depends upon the, the fiscal ability of the community and their decision to be able to provide that fire protection service. But the reality is the fire service in America started as all volunteer, back to Ben Franklin. It goes right. way back to, to those days. And volunteerism is still a, an integral part of many public safety systems 
in the country, but the number of people willing to volunteer continues to dramatically decrease every year. And of course, if municipalities cannot afford to hire career people, then, then you get that, that double-edged sword of, of, of a significant problem. So first of all, the, the community has to decide the level of protection and how they're gonna fund it. But the other piece is there is a lot of recruitment and retention best practices out there for both career and volunteer members. And so the, the entity that has uh, uh, the, the authority to make those decisions needs to put into, into place a recruitment program to bring people in who are interested in being a firefighter. And, you know, you, there's always a story of every little kid wants to be a firefighter when they grow up. Uh, that, that's true, but those are changing as well. And uh, there is a significant amount of training requirements and other elements that, to be that firefighter. They are all standardized, as Rip said, uh, and, and they, but they need to be met and they have to be renewed on a regular basis with a continuing head. So having a recruitment and retention program, because the other piece we face is people who leave the service after a couple of years in and they decide to take another job, do something different. So for communities out there, there is some funding available through the Assistance to Firefighter Grant Program, which is a FEMA uh, funded program through congressional activity to fund recruitment and retention programs at the local level. That's a significant financial enhancement to make that work. And then from there, the commitment by the organization to keep their individuals uh, engaged in some fashion throughout their, their lifespan. And usually a career uh, service might be 20, 25, 30 years. A volunteer service could be 40, 50, 60 years. It, it depends upon the nature of the community. But either way, recruitment of new members is a significant issue across the country. And there has to be a look at the best practices at the local, state, and federal levels of what works and what doesn't work. You know, Mark, if I can just add one thing to Ross comments and what we also see, what I've seen is that we have career firefighters that either move, uh, retire and move and they become volunteer firefighters in the Absolutely. new community. And so the number is a bit uh, skewed or we have active career firefighters that volunteer in another community. So it's really, uh, it, it, it's not quite as clear as it appears, but, but as Ron mentioned, I just want to echo the point, and we're seeing across the board, uh, we have vacancy in career status. California is significantly impacted by having a number of vacancies in the career side of the house that, fire, uh, that, that many departments in our state right now are running short staff, which means their, their, their existing staff are working extra hours just to cover their regular shift. That not is further compounded by these wildland fires of which uh, I don't have a number close at hand, but I would speculate that about a, a half to two thirds of the firefighters on these fires, on these large wildland fires, are career firefighters or volunteer firefighters from other communities that are have, right. that have been put on these large fires. So uh, we have a state fire department in Cal Fire in, in the state of California, but their staffing, when you look at it and you look at the number of folks on fires on any given moment, it, you, you'll see there's a big departure there and that, that's made up of your local fire departments adding staffing. So let's talk, uh, let's stay with you, uh, Rick. Uh, talk about the uh, California Fire Fo uh, Foundation, uh, your work and how you fit into this ecosystem of, of uh, su support uh, for firefighters and their families. Well, our foundation was formed in 1987, and the initial focus was on fallen firefighter families and establishing uh, a firefighter memorial. Um, both those were at the time, uh, you know, significant hills to climb, but since then we've established our, our memorial site at the California Capitol, and we have an annual memorial service. But to add to that, we have programs today that support uh, the families of fallen firefighters, we actually have a benefit for them. Uh, a line of duty injured firefighters supporting them. We have a behavioral health program, which we just kicked off uh, in earnest uh, this last year because that is unfortunately uh, a sign of our times, behavioral health and, and distresses associated with being a, a firefighter today. We also have a scholarship program for fallen firefighters uh, children. And then we, on the other side of the house, uh, we deal with disaster victims in general public. We have a disaster fund to where we distribute aid to disaster victims 
be they uh, natural disasters, such as fires or floods or mudslides, as well as uh, other activities. We got involved in COVID. Then we have a grant program which provides funding to organizations that support public education and public preparedness or other things such as fuel reduction to make our communities you know, better prepared to deal with disasters that may come their way, in particular wildfires, but all, all disasters, as well as just better prepared the individuals, you know, how to safely exit. You know, one of the things that we see um, is the notice to leave your homes. There's been a lot written lately about these wildfires, the rapid expansion very quickly, you know, expanding to large fires and people have very limited time to get out. So whether when their local fire department knocks on the door and says, you need to leave now, that we want to encourage people to be prepared to leave and ready to leave and know what to do to leave and then get out. One of the things that, that really strikes me is that uh, your work, Ron, is you're not only uh, honoring fallen firefighters, but you become advocates to prevent the next death, right, on measures that can be taken. Talk a little bit about uh, about the, the full aspect of, of your work and also that aspect that is uh, really also about advocacy to prevent the next death. Absolutely. So the foundation was actually created in 1992. And the main purpose of the foundation uh, at that time was to honor every firefighter in America that dies in line of duty and to help the families of those fallen firefighters rebuild their lives. Uh, we were created by public law through Congress. Senator Paul Sarbanes was kind of our, our champion in our creation. And, and we've been doing that since our creation. We run the National Memorial Service each October in Emmitsburg, where the names of the fallen firefighters from the previous year are added to that memorial. And we also reach out when a line of duty death occurs. We have response teams in every state that provide support and assistance immediately upon the notification of a firefighter's fatality. And they'll help the, the departments deal with uh, some of the processes if they if they're needed. It's it's a, a kind of uh, if you need us, we're here. If you need us to stay in the wings, we'll do that, too. But we're here to help. And, and so we reach out to the departments, provide them assistance through their the funeral process. We even have a relationship with the International Association of Fire Chiefs. If a department needs some additional staffing or command support, uh, because the 911 calls continue. Even, even though that firefighter has died in the line of duty. And, and we, we do that to, to support the departments, but also we immediately reach out to the families because our programming is, is long-term. We're there for as long as they need us. And uh, we're servicing families from 20, 30 years ago. It, it, it just all depends upon how it, the process is for them to get that new level of normalcy, whatever that might be after the traumatic loss of their firefighter. So we too have scholarship programs. We do uh, life skill training, everything from uh, auto repairs to home repairs 101, because oftentimes the firefighter is the made breadwinner of the family unit. Uh, he or she may be the person that handles all of the home details, home activities. And so we want to give the rest of the family unit some of those uh, training and, and some experiences on how to deal with that. Plus, the other piece that we, we, we work on, as you mentioned, is reducing firefighter fatalities and injuries. Because our belief is if we could reduce the occurrences of those deaths and injuries, it doesn't even put the family through the stressors of the traumatic loss. Right. And, and then, therefore, that family unit stays whole and, and continues to go on with their life uh, in, in any fashion that they so choose. And, and some of that is a result of the development of 16 firefighter life safety initiatives which is the blueprint for reducing firefighter deaths and fatalities across the country that was developed in 2004 by a group of fire service representatives who gathered to say, we need to, we need to really strengthen the safety and survivability of the fire service community. So those programs are all available through our, our website at firehero.org. And we love talking about them. And we love sharing information about them. And we're more than willing to do that with anybody that wants to hear us talk about it. We talk a little bit about um, the different um, uh, attitudes toward the whole idea of, of uh, trauma and effect on mental health and effect on families, because we're all um, of, of, of that age where uh, we've gone from being uh, macho young, uh, young fellows um, with a society that basically uh, skewed toward valuing that 
this sort of idea of being uh, independent and strong and so on and so forth. And the whole idea of, of, of mental health issues denoting weakness to perhaps a, a change in, in attitude that is still underway in which uh, we understand that we're all in, in a mental health journey, right? At all points in our lives. And if we are stressed in certain ways, all of us will respond in, in, in ways that are not necessarily productive for ourselves, for our families and so on. How, how do you see, Rick, this, this journey having progressed in your own uh, career uh, through these, uh, these decades of service? And how do you think we should be um, looking at the question of uh, PTSD and mental health and so on um, when it comes to supporting our firefighters? Well, I think first and foremost, the whole mental health, behavioral health issue is, is something that's significant in today's fire service world. Um, and there's a number of reasons why, but it manifests itself in several ways. And it, and it also impacts the entire family. You know, I, I think that one of the things that uh, many folks uh, don't fully appreciate, and, and Ron uh, alluded to it just a second ago, is that firefighters are away from home a significant amount of time, a significant amount of time. They're probably really, we talk about one third, two thirds, but the fact of the matter is they're probably gone as much as they're home. And when they do come home because of the workload, the call volume, the type of work, they're generally sleep deprived when they walk in the door and they're carrying literally and physically and emotionally extra baggage. And so I, don't, I think we, we are at the awareness stage right now. I think uh, our, our profession has come to the realization that mental health is a, an issue. I think there are several organizations that are starting to now address it in a meaningful way. Have we done enough? enough? Absolutely not. I, I do think the environment of which a firefighter works today is, is probably a better place than where I started my career in that there's an acknowledgement. Uh, again, as Ron mentioned, the kitchen table, so much in a firefighter's life surrounds that kitchen table. Right. And that's really where many of us are trying to adduce, introduce the notion that it's okay to get some help. And uh, many organizations like our own, like our own foundation, is working on making that kind of part of the daily routine. But it, it is a real problem. And I think it's coupled with things like sleep deprivation. There's an expectation put on firefighters today um, of being the, the Swiss army knife in the toolbox. That it, it, in most communities, when you dial 911, that was a great advent when they came up with the national standardized uh, phone number. But when you couple that with cellular phones and everybody's got one in their pocket, they're making a lot of calls. And our colleagues in law enforcement have a narrow window that they address and the rest is just there. And so many times firefighters become uh, the solution by default. And so that puts a great deal of pressure on today's firefighter. So yes, mental health is, is, a, is a problem. Um, Post-traumatic stress is a huge issue. Uh, in today's environment. So, and, and it also has a tremendous impact on the spouse or the children of firefighters. And I can't overemphasize that. And to, to piggyback on what Rick is saying, unfortunately, firefighters see the worst in our communities and they deal with it every day. And that brings additional stress levels to them. But I have to say, I agree with Rick that, that the fire service has recognized that there is a need. It used to be just suck it up and move on, but, but not anymore. And we have work, though, that needs to be done to, to reduce that stigma relative to behavioral health, mental health, whichever you want to call it. But, you know, for us, the, the piece that we found to be most beneficial was a program that was actually developed in the military. And it was developed through small, the small unit leadership components that uh, they put in place through the work of uh, General Schmittel. And, and what happened was it developed in a program called Stress First Aid, developed for the military under the title of Psychological First Aid. But to, to, to deal with the stigma and, and to get beyond mental health and psychological, the, the, the Stress First Aid really is that, that avenue. And that is a, a peer-based program, as I'd mentioned earlier. 
who better than to sit down around the kitchen table than, than other firefighters? And what we've learned along the way is that many times firefighters knew when one of their partners, their, their, their workers was in trouble, but just didn't know how to deal with it. So they remained silent. And I, I use this all the time. You know, I still are from TSA. If you see something, say something, because that's the best way to intervene with, with PTSD. You know, we have an issue of suicide in public safety. We have a su- uh, issue of substance abuse and alcohol abuse and, and family marital problems. And, and they, can, they can be addressed as best as possible by having somebody intervene and provide support and getting somebody to that level of, of help that they need. And, and saying that it's okay to, to, to acknowledge I need help. And, and it's, it's okay to get that support. That, that's, that's a critical piece for all of us. Well, I, I also think that, that we all have um, a, a little bit of thinking to do in terms of who we are. Um, you know, if you take a look at services that are male dominated, there tend to be uh, attitudes that are not necessarily functional. Um, that can that can permeate, and I think we have to learn and become more um, analytical in terms of of how we look at our own behaviors and our own attitudes, and adjust those attitudes if they're going to help someone beside us who is struggling. Because that person beside us, we could be that person next time. Do you do you feel that that, that there's a, that there's an aspect here that we need to perhaps have our families? Uh, become part of our our own adjustment in thinking because our families certainly understand things that we don't necessarily understand. I'm not suggesting that all firefighters are male. I'm not suggesting any any such thing. But I but I am suggesting that there has been a traditionalist attitude that is not necessarily helpful in pursuing pursuit of our mission and in strengthening the service that is so important to American civil society. Rick, you were, you were gonna say something? Well, I, I think, Mark, um, it, it, it's not so much a male-dominated uh, impact as much as, you know, firefighters have one unique thing and it's the closest uh, I, can, I can relate to would be the military. But the, the slight difference between the military and the uh, firefighter is, and I, as I understand it, in the military, you know, you'll work very closely with a unit. You may work there for several years and then you may be transferred or you may move to a different assignment. It, it's not unusual in the fire service that you work in the same fire station or with the same couple dozen people for many years in a row. And so what happens is when a new firefighter comes into that atmosphere, they're introduced to that culture and that culture continues generation after generation. And that's not a bad thing necessarily. So change takes time. Right. And, and also to introduce a new theory, as, as Ron mentioned, you know, it, it, when I started, we didn't acknowledge anything. You know, it, we didn't, you know, you just took it. You look at your mentors, you know, the senior members of your crew, and you go on a horrible auto accident as an example, or it, sometimes it was just other types of calls and you look at them and they, we get back to work and, and you go, okay, that's the way we do it. And so it, 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 for the awareness, and I mentioned earlier, we're, we're in a period of awareness. And now we've, we've consciously said, listen, there's a problem because you're right. We've seen an increase in the issue of, of divorce and substance abuse and just overall not feeling good about ourselves is the real deal. So I think that's where firefighters are really unique. They spend 24 to 48 hours the career firefighters in the same location, in the same house, eating, you know, cleaning, working, training, going to calls, dealing with adversity together. And so that becomes your nucleus. Quite honestly, it's almost embarrassing to say, you have, a, you, it's a safe haven too. I remember as a firefighter going to the fire station, I always knew what I was gonna get, you know? And so it, it becomes your second home. Right. And so we, we do need to crack the code on that one. And change has to come from within ourselves. It cannot be imposed from outside, no matter how well intentioned yeah. it might be. It's got to it's got to come from within. Ron, you were going to you were going to say something. So I was going to say one of the, the programs that I saw that was pretty successful along the way before the before at the Fallen Firefighters Foundation, I was with Prince George's County, Maryland and did my career there. 
we had a program where we had family night. So immediately upon graduation of the recruits, we would invite all of their families to come in and, and have one of our, uh, our, our behavioral health specialists, but also some of our senior staff explain to them, the family members, what it's like to be in a fire service family now, because that's a radical change for, for many family units. There are a lot of individuals who come up through the volunteer ranks, as Rick said, and become career. So they grew up that way. I mean, I, I dated my wife in high school. I was a volunteer firefighter. She knew what she was getting into 40 some years ago. But for a new family, you know, not understanding. And I use this term fraternally, that that instinct of that family unit Rick talked about at the station. You know, not only do you hang out at the station, but oftentimes, you know, there's there might be softball games or bowling leagues or picnicking and, and water sports that, that you do with that crew. And, and it's hard for the spouse and, and the family to understand that of why is the firefighter always with coworkers? Well, it's that bond. You know, uh, that develops as uh, as we heard in the military as well, because you're as, in essence, you put your life in the hands of your coworkers each and every day when you're you're in that that structural uh, uh, facility or you're in that wildland fire. You're depending upon them to get you out. And so it, it builds that uniqueness. But having the families get an understanding of that early on in a person's career service, volunteer service, that that commitment to the to the fire industry is critical. And, and then, you know, there are some great programs for the spouses of, of firefighters so they can kind of commiserate and, and talk about things and, and discuss elements that how did, you know, another firefighter spouse get over some of those elements? You talk about the shift work, you know, they're not home at night where, you know, when I grew up, my dad worked in a steel mill dinner was at six o'clock every night and we were together every evening. That's just the way it was, you know, that, that, but not anymore. The whole family nucleus is, is different. It's, it's evolving because of the shifts and there are a variety of shifts, 24 hour shifts, 42 hour shifts, day work, uh, night work. And so you, you, you got to kind of help the family members understand that and by bringing them into that fold, we've seen much more success and longevity of the family unit because they have a better understanding of what they're getting into. Such an important work. Rick, we're going to give you the last word. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I, I just want to say, you know, to add on something that Ron said, in, in the fire department and across, there's kind of a joke, but it really isn't a joke. It's true. If the water heater is going to go down out, if the fence is going to fall down, you're going to be at work. Firefighter families end up at family events without the firefighter. It happens every single year. This year, my Thanksgiving will be on a Wednesday because my son and my stepdaughter are two different shifts. So working, yeah. we're going to have Thanksgiving on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. If you've been around a firefighter family, and that's why what's another reason why firefighters tend to socialize amongst their group because they're they work a non-traditional schedule. Your your regular friends are at work when you're home and they're home when you're at work. Fridays and Saturdays don't have the same meaning in a firefighter household or Sundays for that matter. Ron brings an interesting point and I close on that notion. You know, he he like my his his dinner was at six o'clock, our dinner was at five thirty. My parents, my mother, you'll sit down, you'll be at the table because we eat together every night, which we did the whole time I was home. Exactly. Not at my family. Not for 35 years. And now I'm living it again, second generation with my son. You know, this is so important that we all are aware because we all depend on you. So I wanted to thank you as, as a civilian for the education that you provided me and, and thank you on behalf of, uh, of our audience for the work that you've done. Chief Rick Martinez, Executive Director of the California Fire Foundation and Chief Ron Sonicki, Executive Director of the, of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation in Maryland. Thank you so much for your work. Thank, please thank your staffs, your constituents, and the firefighters uh, who support us all. Um, and thank you so much for, again, the education that you're providing us. Really important topics, uh, not sufficiently discussed and explored, but I think you've helped us uh, quite a bit today. So have a great, have a great day, stay safe, and uh, please thank everyone for us.
Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much.